So, um, most of these pigeons are, uh, what, what would you say most of them spend their time up in the trees or well, down, on the, down on the ground? Actually, um, even that is largely determined by the type of bird it is. Uh, bleeding heart doves are forest floor walkers, and that's what they're doing all the time, walking, walking back and forth on the ground. They'll perch up occasionally during the day, and they'll always perch up at night. Green wing doves uh, are, as you can see, most of these are perched high. I don't have any on the ground right now, and they might feed on the ground, as most doves do, but they're not going to be searching for anything, pacing the floor. Um, so, so, so they're in the wild, they're, they kind of live solitary, solitary lives yep, definitely. on the floor. So yep. when they roost at night, do they yep. all roost in one area? Yep. Well, the pairs will, absolutely. You know. But you don't have big flocks of like rock doves no, or something not, like that? No, not at all. Not at all. Now, I'll tell you a funny story that I'm so glad I got to witness. Back in the 80s, I, I actually purchased a whole bunch of newly imported fruit doves. They were actually pink neck fruit doves oh, from gorgeous birds. Yep. And um, I turned them loose in one of my aviaries, which is, they're not large, they're 12 feet long and 4 feet wide, 7 feet tall. I had one small tree, potted tree, in the aviary that was only about maybe 4 feet tall. And all day long, those fruit doves stayed up on the perches, and everything was fine and dandy. And I came back late in the afternoon or early evening as the sun was setting, and I looked into the flight, I couldn't see a single fruit dove! Like, oh my God, what happened? And then I realized they had all come down to the tree and they were all roosting, all of them, in that little <laughs> tiny tree. Because that's what fruit does do. Yep. They look for a sheltered place to hide. And let me tell you, in that aviary, they were invisible in that one little tree. And I thought to myself, gosh, that, I learned so much by just watching that behavior yep. the first day. So, you let most of these sit and yeah. hatch out their own? In fact, do you ever hand raise anything? Hopefully never. <laughs> Hopefully never. You know, when my mother was alive, she enjoyed doing that. And we... we was, was she old school? Did she take the corn and stick it in her mouth? And no, it and no. We, we, she, we would concoct, <coughs> concoct these formulas with baby stuff. This was long before you had... Yeah, yeah. My, my, my mother used to raise parrots and yeah, you'd go to the did. store, you'd buy baby food exactly. and you'd mix it up. Exactly. We, we yep, did the yep. same thing. So, um, but, but the old school guys, I know, they would chew they, it, they would chew it and, <laughs> and that's where you get the bird keeper's lung from because they would inhale the spores. And well, you see, I think throughout Latin America, that's still a very common practice, yeah. you know? I mean, if you think about it, the enzymes in your saliva probably help, help start digesting, right. but you know, that's the thing is you risk getting aspergillosis, which is a chronic disease. Yeah. And, uh, uh, so we, my mother would hand feed a lot of things if they were abandoned. So you got, your mother got you into it. No, I don't It's know. all your mother's fault. It, I, <laughs> actually, in a way it was because they always kept the chicken yard in the, in, mm -hmm. at our home. So I was fascinated by the ducks and chickens, you know. And uh, it probably wasn't a big surprise when I got into exotic birds. I know they all thought I'd grow out of it. Mm -hmm. well, I guess most parents even, they hope they hope, they hope you do. But you know, uh, I have to admit, when when they saw what I could do with birds uh, and the money that I could bring in raising an exotic dove, their disposition changed completely. You know, these were old school people that grew up in the depression, so they didn't throw anything away. You know, they saved everything they could, and the idea that I could raise a pair of bleeding heart doves and sell that to somebody for 300 bucks was mind-blowing to them, yep. you know? In fact, I'll, I'll share this with you. Back in the uh, mid-70s, I bought a single pair of rule rule partridges only because the guy who had them was selling out completely and I went to his home and they were sitting outdoors in an aviary and the previous week it had been in the low 30s or if not below 30. And I called a guy up in Texas, a guy by the name of Ray Wrangler who bred Ble uh, rule rules and I told him he says you should buy that pair because they're not cold hardy birds. I went and bought that pair of rule rules. And I'm not kidding you, I, I, had, I must have had the white leggern form of rule rule. My mother, and I, I attribute it to her, raised 48 young from that one bird, that one pair, in one year. 
And this was back in the 70s when Rule Rules were selling for 300 bucks a pair. Yeah, that was, so that was that's a high price bird. They built this entire building at pair of Rule Rules because they just bred and bred and bred and people wanted Rule Rules. It was amazing. I mean, that's hard to imagine it really happened yeah. that way. Yeah. It's like, uh, I, I remember, I, I unfortunately never got to meet him, but Mickey Olson oh, yes. had uh, written an article how he made it's something crazy, like eighty thousand dollars off a pair of African crown cranes and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. And this is going back, you know, in the seventies or or eighties or whatever, too. I'm, I feel so fortunate that I actually drove out to his place to meet him and bought some very rare curacaos from him back in the eighties, and um, got to meet Bernard Rohr at the same mm -hmm. time. Uh, so it was a it was a treat to meet these people, and it's, what a sad note that he just recently passed away. But uh, he really did accomplish a lot. There's no yeah, unfortunately, about that. there's a lot of people I've, I've been like, yeah, I gotta get out and and, and meet them and, and you know visit a collection. And I wait it's a day late and two a dollar, yeah. dollar for them. Well, you know, I, I must admit it. Uh, my friend Shelly Place, who was a curator of birds at the Houston Zoo, and I traveled together on that particular trip, and um, I picked up the last. Curacao's that Mickey had of several of two different species. Unfortunately, I was never able to pair them up because there were no others left in the U.S. Well, what kind of curacao? Um, well, at that time they were there were razor bill curacao's. Mm -hmm. Some have since have recently come in, or yeah, as I, we saw some. They're breeding well, and uh, the other one, which I don't think has returned, was um, I know the genus and species. It was Me Too, Me Too, which is uh, the crestless. Curacao. Yeah, I seen it's, a, it's a small version of a razor bill without the racer on the bill. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so um, anyway, it was a fun trip, and I got to meet some old timers like that. You know, I, I, I will admit Bernard Rohr's place was hysterical because I actually saw lead beater cockatoos being kept in chicken wire cages, and I'm thinking they could get cut through that in a heartbeat if they wanted to. You know. So we used to keep up. Uh, Macaws in, well, I mean, this is like what, uh, this, you 14 can, gauge here? Yeah. But we used to keep, you, you can't keep them in, and you can keep macaws in something like that, but they'll just clip all these, right. every other one. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So they'll stay in it, but they'll have a bunch of. Uh, My, actually, no regrets. In, the, in about 1980, a friend of mine and I became interested in cook bills. So we pooled our resources together and bought macaws and grays and cockatoos and eclectus and in a few years we had a very nice collection of parrots and they began breeding and my mother was hand feeding things and uh, that lasted until 1992 about a 12 year period when we both got burnt out on hand feeding yeah, yeah, yeah. and in fact we started forming them out to others to hand feed on a percentage because it's just too much. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, That's the thing, the thing that people never really understood about parrots is, you know, a, it, it's it's hard to make money out of it because it's hard work. It is. It's very not easy. I mean, you know, and I'm not going to say it wasn't lucrative, uh, you know, it was fun for a while, but then after a while the fun wore off. The fun became work. Yeah, you know, and, and yeah. we decided we had enough. and. Uh, uh, actually gave the collection to somebody on a five-year loan with the idea that if we wanted them back at the end of five years, we'd take them. If not, we'd sell them to him and we never took them back. You know, no regrets. You couldn't give me a macaw today. Absolutely not. I'd like a pair of little blue golds and scarlets or something like that. Well, I, I say you couldn't give me a macaw, and that's only because they are extremely loud. I, I, I treated myself last year to two pair of Quakers. Yeah, I saw that. Those are loud. <laughs> Those are loud, too.